The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Toby Manhire with Gone by Lunchtime. Absent today, your friends and mine, Ben Thomas and Annabelle Lee Mather. We will return to normal service very soon. But a special episode today, Grant Robertson departed recently the Houses of Parliament after a long career as a Labour MP, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. He started, of course, as a parliamentary staffer back in the day in the offices of Marion Hobbs and then Helen Clark, where he became known as H3 and eventually was elected as the MP for Wellington Central and onwards and upwards and from there. After his valedictory speech the other week on Wednesday, March 27, I got together with him at the Basin Reserve cricket ground um, because we'd conducted an interview there so many years before and so it was a way of bookending of a sort. Uh, We sat down in the great R.A. Vance stand just above the change rooms there um, at the end of Kent Terrace and talked about the difficult last election year, uh, the tax switch that wasn't about the COVID response and whether or not that made the rich richer. Uh, We talked a bit about why his grandchildren call him GG and also sought to find a place of accord between him and Chris Bishop on one of the most important questions facing the nation. Oh, obviously because we're sitting at the cricket, you can hear a bit of the cricket Uh, If you don't like the sound of cricket, then I don't know what's wrong with you. I can't help you, but maybe another podcast will work. So forgive a few little tidy snips and edits to remove the sound of the most obtrusive bits. Here we are at the Basin Reserve uh, with Grant Robertson, the former MP. Yes, former MP MP as of 11.59 Friday night uh, last week. And I've got a um, test to assess the extent to which you have decompressed from that, yeah? What did you make the budget policy statement as well? <laughs> Came out today. Yeah. I have had one text message about it, and I have not read it. I've read the text message, but I haven't read the budget policy statement yet. So, But I, I feel like I will end up reading it, so I'm being a bit of a fraud. I okay. think I will read it later But that's tonight. progress. That's progress. Yeah, but I didn't try and watch it live or anything yeah. like that. That would have been the tragic I was thing. here, so... We're watching the white ferns. Uh, struggling a bit in the second they innings are, against England. They are, unfortunately. They need about 10 and over from here, which will be tough. You uh, recently completed a very important job, being the sports minister. That's correct. Um, the most important, uh, yep. And um, will you, are you willing to go on the record and agree with your successor as sports minister, Chris Bishop, on the point that the Basin Reserve is the home of New Zealand cricket? I think I am. I think there is bipartisan agreement in this instance. I mean, I've watched a lot of cricket everywhere around New Zealand, and on a good day here at the Basin, with the grass banks and all of that. Mm. I tell you, Hagley is a beautiful ground too. Sure, um, yeah. sure. But, um, it's not the home of cricket, though. It's not the home of cricket. And of course, because Auckland doesn't really have a cricket venue, no, um, we get to do that. That's oh, a good shock. shock. 
we just watched um, one bounce before. Halliday put that into uh, yeah one bounce before in the mid wicket area. Still on cricket. Yes. Last time, one of the reasons that we are meeting here is mm. because I interviewed you a long time ago when you yep. were the. Um, Opposition the Labour finance spokesperson. Opposition finance spokesperson at the base and reserve. Reserve, yep. And New Zealand were playing, I forget who. Was it Sri Lanka? I, I it feel like it might have been Sri Lanka. And I asked you if you were a member of the New Zealand cricket team, who would, who would you be? God, what did I say? And immodestly, you said say? somewhere between Ross Taylor and <laughs> Kane <laughs> Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's outstanding. Uh, I, I obviously had ambition. And so the question now would be which white fern? would you identify with? Well, I think I have to identify with a retired white fern, don't I? So, um, probably Katie there Martin. Goes, there goes another worker. Yeah, yeah Katie Martin. Martin. Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, and she's, she's, well, she's transferred into a thriving a career as a... As a commentator. Pundit. Yeah, as a an pundit. expert. Is that your plan? <laughs> no, actually, it isn't. I um, suppose your new employer at Otago yeah, University would be too heavy with you popping up on with that, nice doesn't. politics. No. What? No, I mean, punditry and politics is an interesting thing, isn't it? Like, I think we need it, you know? Yeah. Um, and the left, I think we sometimes feel that we're a bit underserved, you know, that the, some of the media outlets have a few more right-wing commentators than they do left-wing ones, but sadly, that won't be me. Not well, for, not the for right, at least the, the right next five the same, years, The right anyway. say the same thing, though, don't Yeah, they? I guess so. It's yeah. kind of... Um, uh, and what's your... Before you start your role, not as a political pundit, but as vice chancellor of Otago University, your alma mater, what what are you going to do in between? So um, we've got to pack our house up, and so we've got 21 years worth of rubbish to okay. deal with. And then um, end of April, beginning of May, we're off overseas for a holiday, which will be fantastic to give myself a bit of distance from one job before I take the next one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, start off in Dunedin on the 1st of July. Um, you excited about that? It's been a bit of pushback, a bit of pushback, like not an academic. Yeah, yeah. that was pretty expected though, wasn't it? I mean, there hasn't been an academic in the vi a non-academic in the vice chancellor's role ever in the 154 years. So I think that had to be expected. Um, and maybe a little bit of, you know, can I make the transition out of politics mm -hmm. into this? But um, I've got a pretty long history with Otago and I like to think of myself, to use a Jacinda Ardernism, as academic adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd ain't clapping that very good joke, they're clapping a, a boundary. A tidy, a tidy tuck around the corner mm -hmm. for four. Um, <laughs> now, there's a, because now, because we're at the base of reserve, reserve, there are two ambulance ambulances tearing down Adelaide Road. That's right, getting stuck in the traffic, um, so that'll be really noisy. This is great, I'm loving this, it's very authentic. It's a true basin experience. Keep going. <laughs> The, you gave your valedictory last week uh, to a full house and all that was emotional, it was moving. One of the things that you said was New Zealand's tax system is unfair and unbalanced. Did you think about whether to say that or not? Or, you, was that, or did you need to say that? I felt like I needed to say it. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, it's no secret to anybody that I... We've had a couple of cracks at trying to address the unfairness and the lack of balance, both, you know, when we worked on a CGT when we were in government with New Zealand First and the Greens, and then latterly in the package that David Parker and I were working on. So um, circumstances conspired to mean that those two efforts didn't succeed, but yeah. it doesn't change my view on that. And Chris Hipkins spoke a little bit about that in his speech that he gave on Sunday. You know, and I think you know there has to be action in that space. And I just, I don't know. You've got to be upfront about these things. You give a speech about all the wonderful things you've done or whatever. Um, I felt like it was important to talk about something that I wanted to do but I didn't get to. Yeah, and so you're right. Chris Hipkins came out and expressed sentiments that suggested there needed to be a change, structural change, and so forth. You almost think if only you guys had had a majority <laughs> government for three years. Yeah, and as I say, I had a plan that. Um, that was heading in that direction. Um, obviously Jacinda had made some comments about what she was prepared to do and not prepared to do, and we had to work our way through that. Um, we wanted to get it right. I felt like we were heading in the right direction. Chris didn't, um, and he was the leader, and I think we had to respect that. So, yeah, um, I, you know, the, the three years of, of majority government was definitely a period where I felt we could make that change, but we just didn't quite get there in the end. 
And if you were offering genuinely non-partisan advice to future politicians, would you would you say go comprehensive capital gains tax or wealth tax or a bit of both? Or? Um, I think both are doable. Um, and as I said in my valedictory speech, it's not really me anymore that gets to decide that. Um, but I think both put it this way, both would make a difference to that fairness question. Mm. Um, obviously a CGT is a more known quantity, you, there are more of them in existence around the world, um, but they also come with exemptions and exclusions and things. A wealth tax is less uh, tried, but does take to the super wealthy for whom you feel that there really is a gap in what they're paying. So I think either would be doable. Um, and either would be a really good start to, to addressing some of the issues we've got. You, you touched on um, Cinder Ardern basically saying she would resign if she did the same thing that you know John Key did on um, uh, changing the age of super. Yeah. Um, you know, Nicola Willis recently said she'd resign or was um, encouraged to say and she'd resign if she didn't introduce the tax cuts. What do you think about that generally? Generally speaking, it's it's. I mean, I mean, we in the media are probably responsible to a degree, but it, mm. I understand it's a kind of inoculation process. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, it's a funny thing. I, I think, objectively, I don't love it, you know? I think that sort of absolute, you know, I'll resign if I do this, or, you know, you should resign if you don't do that. Um, it's hard. I mean, I used to call it the rule-in, rule-out game as a version of that, which TV3 were uh, the greatest protagonists of, you know, mm. and it's just, you know... What you know, life keeps moving, and if somehow or other, if you don't say you're gonna rule in or rule out something, it creates this story. So you almost feel like you've got to do it, and then once you do it, you know that becomes a thing that gets hung around your neck. So I don't love it. I think politics is fluid and dynamic, and sometimes you will be able to do things. Sorry, will not be able to do things that you wanted and set out to do. Mm. But um, you know, it's up to politicians to either say yes or no to that, isn't it? That year and that last year, oh, it's a lovely lofted off drive. For Calladay, well done. Down to the fence uh, for four runs. That last year, in which you had a crack, you and David Parker and maybe some others put forward the wealth tax, the tax switch as it was conceived. That year, how hard was it? Because it was, you decided after Jacinda Ardern uh, said that she was going to step away, you'd thought about it and thought, no, I'm not going to go leader and you've talked about that various mm. times so uh, then you decided to stick it out though you wanted to yep. be there and you wanted to push through the election income insurance which was one of your brain children babies whatever mm -hmm. uh, thrown on the the old the proverbial bonfire um, the tax switch was jettisoned from from Lithuania or something like that I think <laughs> I can't remember where the statement came from uh, you had to uh, swallow a dead beetroot flavoured rat, <laughs> boondoggle flavoured rat yep. on the uh, fruit. Yep. That was must have been that must have been all tough, tough time to oh, yeah. wade through. I mean they were, it wasn't great, eh? It, it, you know, but on the flip side, I think right now watching what the what the government's doing um, is the very reason why despite those things not going the way I wanted them to. I still was there to fight because there was a lot more to fight for than just those policies. Um, in the case of both of them, essentially the major ones, the tax and the income insurance, I, I feel like they will have their day. Um, eventually people will think we need to have something more comprehensive for a big economic shock when people lose their jobs and on the tax one I'm convinced that that will happen as well. So timing is everything in politics. and. Um, in the end, my timing was probably a bit off on those particular areas, um, but I still believe in them, and I still think they're important. It's important work. Uh, was there any moment in the course of that year when you think, oh, maybe I should have just, maybe <laughs> I should have just, because it was right there. Yeah, yeah. For you to go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be leader up to the election. I'll give it a whirl. I'll be prime minister. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I thought about. I, obviously, I thought about it. You know, yeah. I thought about the taking the job, and then. It was a very difficult year, 2023. The, the people underestimate just how impactful the cyclones and the Auckland anniversary weekend floods were. Obviously, the people who happen to don't underestimate that. They know what happened to their lives. But from a political perspective, it was it was really, really difficult. And, it, and I was... Probably one thing 
and on reflection. Chris asked me to be the cyclone recovery minister because it was so challenging. We were bringing all these different agencies together and doing all of these things and, and not not having that role made the year really, really challenging. Um, so, you know, in many ways felt... Hey, good. Um, in many ways felt that was probably one of the tougher bits was had all that going on plus I was trying to do this cyclone thing and it was a big year but I, I stand by the decision I I knew I didn't have inside me what I knew the job required and I was happy to carry on and support Chris and hopefully get us another term but no I don't, I don't regret the, the decision The cyclones you're right were so huge and impactful and, it, and we talked about this on the podcast but I remember writing that this is going to last all the way into the election that's not far away. It will be an important mm. uh, part of the uh, election event. I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I was dead wrong. It wasn't really. No, it wasn't. Why, and, why and is fun, that you know, I mean, uh, uh, in a funny way, I think it's because we did handle it okay. Mm. You know, that we actually did the things that we needed to do. We got money into those areas. Um, I guess I'm talking as much about the more macro picture of the yeah. role that climate played in that, which wasn't yeah. entirely a climate change event, whatever. The, yeah. the, that it was because it's that now a material, thing, material. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, I think I feel like the dis- people's decisions about elections. You know, that, I mean, every person are going to be driven by different things, but the cost of living, crime. That stuff was just so much bigger, and um, that's a ridiculous thing to say because climate is obviously bigger than all of those things. But in people's immediate lives and experiences, it was bigger. And because the the weather events could be geographically kind of put there, that allowed other people not to really worry about them. So, and I think we dealt with them about as well as we could. But yeah, very hard. I mean, but an election like that. I mean, I I said this in an interview the other day that. Even if we'd got that tax policy through, I still don't think we would have won the election. I think that the tide was going out, and, and that was when did you when did you think that you knew that the tide was going? Oh, out? I think you know through, through the middle of the campaign, I was we just weren't making ground, um, and we were just too far behind. And you just did, it's really interesting. I've had elections either as a volunteer or a candidate where people won't look you in the eye and they won't. You know, and you, you know you're going to lose. It wasn't one of those. Like people were quite almost sympathetic to us. You know, they were like, and there was. I don't know if I told the story. Yes, I did in one interview. But um, I knocked on the door up in Karori of a, a woman who was lovely and really nice. And then at the end, she said, "Well, I'm not going to vote for you guys." And I said, "Oh, would you mind me asking why not?" And she said, "Oh, well, you've had nine years." <laughs> so, I know it's felt like that. It has for all of us. But, yeah. You know, well, I, we, I think we talked about this a little bit when I um, ended up to the election that it, I think of it as a concertina yeah. government because it at once uh, felt like nine years in lots of ways, but you had three really? years actual yeah. government, government yeah. work. You know, I yeah. mean, um, um, that's not to you know, that's not to make a judgment on it either way. Yeah. Except it was weird. Time yeah. worked in a weird, weird way. way. And I did. So I just feel like yeah. So I mean, you know, in that you always fight hard in an election campaign because that's who we are. But it doesn't mean when you're lying in bed at the end of a long day's campaign and you aren't sitting there you're thinking, well, that that's probably not going to happen for us now. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. And COVID was the thing, of course, the big, the big, the big, the big thing that, you know, lurched up and changed everything. And when you look back at that, you obviously had to act fast. You made decisions that put money into people's pocket kept the economy going, you faced potential prognostications of high unemployment, all that sort of stuff. So fine. But there's also that, oh, is that out? It's, it's out. going to be caught on the long arm boundary. It is. Had to be done. 
uh, New Zealand's chasing the game, and um, it's probably gone now, this game. Well, the only thing is whether Sophie Devine can just stand there on one leg and swing. So apparently she can't come in until we're five down because she was off the field, field for too long. during the field. She How can many? now come in. Oh, sorry, it's yeah. five. Oh, well, oh, well, that's good and bad. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. So yeah. the, co- the, the COVID thing, there was the, the concerns were the K-shaped recovery, you know, where the... Yeah. And, and some of that is what happened, and yep. you know, with uh, the property owning class ended up sucking up a lot of that money. Yeah, I mean they did, and but that is because of the nature of the New Zealand economy. So, the unless we did an intervention that fundamentally changed the nature of the New Zealand economy, the people who were in a strong position were going to do well. So, in a sense. In your introduction to that question, you talked about us. You know, we were trying to hold still. We were trying to make sure that people kept their jobs, that businesses stayed afloat. And as a result of that, the status quo got expanded almost. And so, because the Reserve Bank, they do make the decisions independently about what they're going to do, and they they kept, you know, that they they kept using the one tool they've got, and they and they injected money supply into the economy. The banks then lent that money in the same way that they always lend money largely to property. So in the absence of an intervention that undid that very, very deep seated structure of the New Zealand economy, that was that was one possible result. And I've been asked and I think and I think it was Thomas Cogman asked me the other day, you know, would there have been another intervention? And yeah, potentially there would have, you know, that we could have said that certain parts of the money that was being injected into the economy could be only used for particular asset classes, so maybe not for property. Mm-hmm. But that isn't a decision that I got to make. That's a decision that the Reserve Bank would have had to have made, and it would have been a quite deep uh, interference in the bank retail banking sector had they done sort of directed them more closely as to where, where that money could go. So. I accept it. I accept that there was property values did inflate. Again, we were in the unknown. We had no idea what was going to happen, and we were trying to cover all our bases. And ultimately, when I put the scorecard together at the end, I'm happy with what we did. Yeah. And if that's such a fundamental kind of structural issue with the with the economy, per B. Hickey, uh, yes. uh, a housing market with some bits stuck on. <laughs> um, is, is, is a capital gains tax the sort of thing that fixes that, or is it there something more helps. fundamental it still? That... It certainly helps. I mean, I guess my the, the thing that it doesn't necessarily address is other ways that New Zealand economy becomes more productive, other ways that higher wage jobs sure. get created. But certainly... Housing supply. Uh, yeah, yeah, and some housing supply, which will always be the biggest determinant. But, but it will certainly help. And, or you know, whichever version of an asset or wealth tax will certainly help address those issues. Yeah. In terms of the whole delivery piece, you know, and the um, uh, the old year of delivery, uh, which was can't remember which one that was. <laughs> um, it was one it was where there wasn't all that much maybe, delivery, if I recall correctly. What about happened to the impl- implementation unit you set up? Did, they, oh, yeah, yeah, did yeah. that ever bear fruit? Um, it was useful. Uh, so in the end, the way it ended up working was that it, we used it to look at some programs that we had going, social housing, various things, and just try and understand where they were at with what perhaps could be tweaked in order to make them deliver better. Um, I think it's, I think we did a review of it at the end and everybody involved in it thought it was useful. I guess what it, what it wasn't probably quite getting to with some of those bigger issues like why doesn't infrastructure get built in New Zealand more quickly and more efficiently and more effectively. It was good on a, at a program level for tweaking programs, but not perhaps up at some of those bigger issues. And, and then the other thing is that we, quite deliberately in a way, we had a thing called the Cabinet Priorities Committee and that met once a month and went through kind of all the things we'd said were part of our program. And, and the implementation unit did sort of deep dives. I think I understand the current government might be looking at almost flipping that around and having the implementation unit more involved in the, I guess, the political priorities, which is a bit more like yeah. 
how Tony Blair originally... The, the deliver all... There was a Thomas Mench piece about yeah, that yeah. the other day, which was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe they might be looking at it. That's Do you think good, that's a good idea? I think it's an interesting idea and probably might be more politically effective, potentially, mm. yeah. It feels as though there's something that needs to be unlocked. And yeah. you were very complimentary about the public service. Good on you, in the valedictory speech. Is there something in that, in that machine that needs unlocking? Oh God, yes. And that was more the other part. And I had to take this out of my speech, actually, because when I, had, I did write a whole section on what is constraining the public service. And without going into all the gory details of it, we need to break the silos down more effectively. And unfortunately, the Public Finance Act and the Public Sector Act still have everything in silos as what are called appropriations in the public finance world. And getting agencies to, to collaborate, work together, focus on what the actual outcome you're looking for is, the problem you're trying to solve, and realising that multiple agencies have a role. We do that, climate change is an example, but I don't know that we do it very effectively, and the money side of it is not well set up. I started to reform that, um, and again, it's one of those kind of works in progress, which I really do hope um, carries on. Um, we can... Public service is one thing. The other... Uh, the bolted on bit is the consultant sector, yeah. if there's such a thing. And you see it physically with the growth of the buildings you know, surrounding the, the beehive. beehive yeah. I mean, amazing. PwC. Did that, did that get a bit out of control? I think it probably, I don't know about it out of control, but it grew, and it grew significantly because Labour governments will always do this. We wanted to do a lot of things. You know, we had major structural changes happening in health, vocational education, water, you know, and there just isn't the capacity in the public sector to take all of that on all in one go. So you invariably use consultants to get that, that extra work done more quickly. COVID obviously was a big factor for that because yeah, yeah. we simply didn't have the people we needed there. So, yeah, I think, I think it grew because we were doing so much. Um, having said that, as a kind of percentage of government spend, it actually was starting to trend down. So, and we had our eye on that because we could see that there was, you know, we wanted more, more full-time capacity in the agencies. Um, shot. Look at that. It's four Played out to school. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a really interesting thing because you. You do want some people you can call on for particular projects, but as I say, we recognise that it was starting to trend down. The current government say they're going to bring it down. I think the more full-time public servants they let go, the more when they actually do try to do something, maybe their plan is to do nothing as a government, but if their plan is to actually do things, then they too will find that they need staff to do that. You, you mentioned COVID and the period where more people came on board and leaving to one side what happened in the Beehive, maybe mm. an echo of what happened in the Beehive was the, the real talent in the public service came together yep. and moved into yep. new floors and yep. whatever building it was. I and totally believe that and I think that that is, so the public, we made some changes to the Public Finance Act and the public, we called it the Public Service Act and that actually allows for more integration. So we've done that now in family and domestic violence, we're doing it a little bit in climate change, where we do bring people from different agencies physically together as well as in terms of their work, Carlo. And, and you know, I do think the world's messy and complex problems need us to look quite differently at the way we structure and organise that. Um, in your valedictory, as another ambulance <laughs> Uh, enters the world's greatest roundabout. Yeah, yeah. Um, you gave particular uh, moving shout outs to three people that, I mean, among others, but there was Alf. Mm -hmm. Tell me about him. Um, the love of my life. Um, we've been together for 25 years. Um, he's not a person, as I said in the speech, he's not a person who loves politics. Um, in fact, you know, borderline actively dislikes it. And, but he's been an amazing part of my life and yeah, you know, I owe him so much for having supported me and it'll be good to spend a bit more time together over the next little while. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've got a family, a built family out of Alfred with his two kids and now our four grandchildren and yeah, it's been amazing. GG, apparently. Granddad Grant. It was because Alf, unbelievably, 
convinced his granddaughters to call him G Diddy. And so they, you know how kids are, like they, you know, like that's just what they call them. So it was G Diddy and G G. So. <laughs> Um, critical question. Yeah. Has Elf ever lived in Dunedin? No. But after it's 25 this, years yeah. of visiting, okay. he's... Well, and, and I just want to say, say he's, he's as keen as I am really? to get down here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, we might have to buy him an extra extra jersey. You need two. to get underfloor heating or something. <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah. probably, you're in some mansion, I don't aren't you? Think getting paid. I don't think it's a crazy amount of money. $600 and something thousand dollars a year. I don't think, I don't think spending a lot of the set university's up a money. Grant Robertson good. scholarship with uh, some of that money? Oh, there's definitely, I've got some ideas about some things I can do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm conscious of the salary I'm getting, and I, there are definitely uh, some areas I want to support students particularly, and so I'll be looking to do that when I get down there. Uh, your dad? Yep. That was a, I mean, for people who have read your stories uh, about about your childhood, he, he was a dearly loved figure who also had uh, made a mistake. This a bit life. more than a mistake, yeah. I mean, he went to prison for theft as a servant from the uh, uh, law firm that he worked at and he stole a significant amount of money from them over, over a long period of time. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was, you know, he was, a, you know, he was, I loved him, but he was a deeply flawed man as well, and, and a hard thing to deal with at the time, obviously. Um, you know, but he was 18, 17, 18 years out of prison when he died, and so obviously his life had moved on, and, and it was really sad to not have him around for a, a, a lot longer. Was that quite a formative experience? I, I yeah, mean, very much. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Longy, Longy's father ended up going through a court process for something that he was ultimately exonerated on, but that was obviously a, it, it kind of woke something up in him about yeah. the world, about justice. I don't know. Was it, was it something like <laughs> that? Almost had the opposite effect well, on me right. because I, um, I was a law student. I was well, I was trying to get into law school at the time, and I actually got in, but decided not to take it up. Is that and, right? Not entirely, but partly because of the experience of, of going through that legal system with Dad. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, the time I spent visiting him in prison was hugely formative to me around my views around um, what, what we use prisons for and, and whether they're of, of a great deal of use for a lot of the people who end up in them. Um, and also just what it meant economically for me and my family. I mean, hugely significant. And your mum? I um, bumped into you one day when I was with my sister and my parents and we were get, driving through Central oh, Otago. Right. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember, it was, maybe it was Lawrence? It or was something Lawrence, like that. yeah, yeah. And you were, you'd, uh, you were finance minister at the time, yeah. but you'd, you'd flown down for the night, I guess, to I see your mum on her birthday. Oh, no, it was, was, it, it was a birthday, you're birthday. right, you're yeah. absolutely right, it was a birthday. Yeah, 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 that's right. And so, I mean, you know, there's a, obviously a real closeness there. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, uh, as I said in the speech, I mean, you know, I have spent a lifetime trying to match my mother, in a way. Like, she's an extraordinary person in, in so many ways, intellectually, compassionately, just as a person generally. And, yeah, I, and I mean, I've, as you know, I've got two brothers who both live overseas, and so for a long time, it, you know, I've been the one here in New Zealand, so I think that's also led me to, you know, keep, you know, keep close with mum. And, um, you know, a lot of the value basis that I have and that, um, and that my brothers and have, and that comes from mum, it comes from her outlook on the world, and she's still very interested politically, <laughs> and um, not not a fan of the limelight, so I've tried not to talk about it too much until the end. You said in the speech, though, that now you'll be able to complain about the government we'll together. Both be able to complain about the government. <laughs> so maybe if you're not available for punditry, it's her turn. Tell you what, she, she would make a fantastic political pundit. <laughs> I'm not sure the shorter form would be good for her, but, um, <laughs> but no. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Hello for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. 
If you have the means, consider supporting our high quality journalism by becoming a spin off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz/slash donate. The Spin Off Podcast Network.